Uh, good morning. So uh, my name is uh, Dennis Burton. I'm the uh, co-chair of immunology and uh, microbiology here at uh, Scripps Research. I'm going to tell you briefly about um, a rational vaccine design. And this is an effort that uh, is not confined to my lab. It involves a number of different, uh, really, premier labs at, uh, at Scripps um, Research who provide very complementary expertise that allow us to take on this really uh, major effort. So um, in terms of, of vaccines, I, I, I'm always staggered by this, even though I know the, the statistic very well, that um, three, about 300 million, some people say up to five, died of smallpox in the 20th century. But nobody's died since 9-11, 1978, because the, uh, the disease was eradicated through vaccination. And that far exceeds you know, deaths from wars and everything else. And I think it's often um, forgotten. Um, how do vaccines work? They work primarily, not exclusively, but primarily through circulating proteins in the blood that you probably know well, antibodies, and they have these key features. They recognize molecular shapes. They can improve the recognition of molecular shapes um, through a proce uh, Darwinian process of mutation and selection given time. And then there's antibody memory. So um, cells that make antibody can live for many years, and you can detect protective antibodies to yellow fever 60 years after you've had the contact. Um, now, given, given these uh, parameters, the um, most conventional vaccines work uh, by designing or, or, or getting hold of mimics of natural uh, infection. And the classical strategy is through live attenuated vaccines, live attenuated pathogen and or uh, killed pathogen. Um, and that works very well for smallpox and measles and so on. But it, that strategy has actually failed for a series of what we often refer to as more difficult pathogens, where the pathogens have evolved mechanisms to avoid antibody uh, responses. And then we argued a number of years ago that we really needed a, a new strategy. And the, observ the key observation that we made was that even for these difficult uh, pathogens, infected individuals, at a proportion, given time, still make protective antibodies if you look hard enough. And we argued that if you, t you could isolate those protective antibodies, and you could investigate them at the molecular level in terms of the molecular shapes that they recognize. And if you could do that, then you could uh, derive these molecular shapes, combine them, and put those in to a vaccine formulation and give them to uninfected um, individuals. And if we've done everything right, if we understand the, uh, all the geometry involved here, then they should induce illicit protective antibodies. And we referred to this as reverse vaccinology. And the, the reason is normally you, you get a vaccine, you generate antibodies. We're saying begin with the antibodies that you know work, work backwards to a vaccine. And this uh, kind of strategy is actually uh, now receiving a lot of success in, in, in uh, the design of a vaccine against respiratory syncytial virus, a nasty virus of kids and, uh, and older folks that uh, has been pretty difficult since the, the 50s. It now looks we're getting a vaccine. And it's also the basis of the effort to design a universal flu vaccine, which we're um, also uh, at Scripps working on. And that would negate the need for a, a seasonal vaccine every year. You'd get one uh, vaccine shot, and you'd be protected against all the different uh, strains of uh, flu. And we know that that vaccine's possible in principle because there are such antibodies out there. Um, but we're focused on HIV, a virus that gains entry to immune cells and, as you know, produces immunodeficiency. And the first stage in the, um, in the infectious process is that the virus gains entry to immune cells by the interaction of these protein structures, envelope spikes on the surface with cell uh, receptors. And the job of, and this is all to scale, <coughs> the job of the antibody, neutralizing antibodies, is to bind to these spikes and interrupt 
the, uh, the entry process, prevent the entry process. But for HIV, there's a complication in that it's not one virus, it's hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of different strains that are circulating in the human population. And so a vaccine's got to induce antibodies that will protect against this vast diversity, so-called broadly neutralizing antibodies, which we know exist and which we have uh, isolated. Um, but, and, and they target more conserved regions of the envelope spike, as shown here. The trouble with the envelope spike is that it's, it's a nightmare for antibody recognition. It's uh, covered in uh, glycans or sugars, shown in purple here, which are poorly recognized by antibodies. Antibodies generally need to uh, access protein surface, which you can see is pretty well um, protected. So inducing uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies is uh, a real problem, but we know um, they exist. And we've isolated them, and together um, with colleagues at Scripps, Ian Wilson and, and, and Andrew Ward in particular, using uh, structural methods, we've been able to characterize how these antibodies are able to beat this complex structure. They use various uh, tricks, such as this long finger-like structure between the sugars to access the protein surface. So this gives us the molecular shape information, and now we want to turn that into a vaccine design. And how do we do that? We've developed procedures, particularly uh, Bill Sheaf at Scripps has done this, and, you know, I don't have time, obviously, to go into the details, but basically we have an approach. We start out with the structural information, computational design. We then select the best designs using uh, display methods. And then we've developed all sorts of animal models that allow us to test uh, how well these things uh, will work. Um, and what we've, the, the major conclusion that we've made is that an HIV vaccine, or a major conclusion, needs to be multi-stage. So we start, I told you initially that antibodies um, uh, can learn, if you like, can be educated. So we start out with this, what we call germline antibodies in natural infection. You take this long and circuitous route to a broadly neutralizing antibody, and a lot of the time you'll just wander off and not make it. What we need to do that's natural infection, what we need to do is to, to do this process in a reproducible, reliable way so that we need our shapes to be well designed so we can take this walk uh, from the, the germline to the broadly neutralizing antibody configuration. And so we've done that, we've designed various molecules, and um, this is the overall strategy to move from germline targeting to a final uh, antibodies. We have um, a, a, a number of these uh, candidates, vaccine candidates, in the clinic now. As you'll see here, a couple more in manufacturing. The results are starting to uh, emerge. We still have many uh, molecules, candidates we're trying out at preclinical stages. And so, you know, we're, we're looking in the next uh, few years to see if we can really actually beat this vi virus by vaccination, by this detailed molecular knowledge. All of this requires very large amounts of funding, and we've had a very generous funding from the NIH and from the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation. And I'll stop there. Thank you.